Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Michal Collins, Assistant Professor of Social Policy from UCD. You're welcome, Dr. Michal. And thank you for making uh, yourself available to meet the committee. Dr. Collins, as you know, uh, the committee has engaged with the Parliamentary Budget Office on their excellent report on tax expenditures and also held meetings with the Revenue Commissioners and the Department of Finance to discuss the issues raised. Following on from that, the committee has issued a request for information to the Department and the Revenue Commissioners seeking a number of summary tables of information on tax expenditures. So today, we wish to discuss a number of issues with you, including the importance of monitoring trends in tax expenditures and the best approach to carrying out parliamentary scrutiny of tax expenditures. So before we hear your opening statement, I want to draw your attention to the position on privilege which applies to witnesses and to advise that by virtue of Section 17, Two, one of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the committee. However, if they are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, they are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of their evidence. They are directed that <coughs> excuse me, only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, they should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they shouldn't comment or criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So, uh, Michal, I invite you now to make your opening statement. Uh, Chair, thank you, and I want to thank yourself and the committee for the invitation to make a presentation on this topic. Um, uh, as was mentioned, I'm an economist based at the School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice at uh, University College Dublin. Uh, I was also a member of the 2008-2009 Commission on Taxation, and within the Commission chaired the SOAP group which examined tax expenditure. Uh, as a researcher, I'm also part of an international research group focused on the links between taxation and social policy, and within that I focus on the often hidden role of the state in using the taxation system to encourage and support certain activities among individuals and corporates via tax expenditure. Um, at the outset, I want to warmly welcome the Select Committee's decision to give attention to the issue of tax <coughs> expenditure. Public policy analysis and discussions are often very limited when it comes to taxation issues a focus which undermines the comprehensiveness and relevance of those considerations. In particular, they can be overly focused on income taxation and as such ignore the other channels via which individuals, households and companies contribute to the state, most particularly via indirect taxes. Similarly, they can often focus on the taxes and social insurance payments collected and ignore those which the state explicitly decides not to collect via tax expenditure. Uh, given that, I think it would be useful for the committee to consider the taxation side of the budget to be approximately 80 to 85 billion euro a year, uh, comprising the taxes collected and the taxes which are not collected due to the provision of various tax expenditures. While we have good projections within the most recent, re recent budgetary documentation from October 2018 of the expected tax to be collected, which will be about 70.77 billion euro this year, we have less insight into the overall cost of the taxation that will not be collected as a result of the provision of tax expenditure. However, given past history and the annual estimates from the Revenue Commissioners, this is likely to be in the order of 10 to 15 billion euro per annum. Overall, given the importance of that revenue to support the running of the state and the redistribution of resources, it is remarkable how little attention the policy-making system gives to the nature and stability of the overall taxation system. Within that, as tax expenditure represents a large part of the system, the current focus of the Select Committee is most welcome and I sincerely hope that such a focus will become a recurring part of its work in the years and decades ahead. Uh, contributions to the Committee of the Department of Finance and the Revenue Commissioners and the recent report which the, the Chair mentioned on tax expenditure from the Parliamentary Budget Office have highlighted that there is some disagreement regarding what to count and what is and what is not uh, tax expenditure. That was an issue the Commission on Taxation grappled with when it was established in 2008 and we resolved it by proposing the adoption of the OECD taxation definition which was the first recommendation of the Commission on the topic of tax expenditure. That definition states that a tax expenditure is 
quote, a transfer of public resources that is achieved by reducing tax obligations with respect to a benchmark tax rather than by direct expenditure. Unquote. There are many measures in the taxation system which technically reduce tax liabilities but are functional as part of the basic operation of the system. For example, intercompany transfers, transfers of maintenance payments between former spouses and methods to facilitate the interaction of individuals and companies with other taxation systems in other states. These are technically tax relieving measures, but they are in effect administrative measures which allow the taxation system to function effectively. Aside from these, where measures are adopted or provided and allow individuals or companies to reduce the tax bills below that which they would otherwise pay, this is a tax expenditure. Uh, therefore, simply a tax expenditure is a measure adopted as part of a budget or finance bill which reduces the amount of tax that would be collected from individuals and firms with the intention of supporting certain activities, encouraging certain actions and or assisting certain needs. In all cases, such measures are discretionary. In other words, it is up to yourselves as policymakers to decide if these are worthwhile measures both to introduce and to retain as they have recurring annual costs. Almost everybody would welcome a reduction in their total tax contribution, but, the discretionary, but such discretionary reductions come at the cost to the overall tax take and shift the cost of supporting public services and redistributive policies onto those who do not benefit from these tax breaks. It is important to ask if the provision of such tax relieving measures is in the broader interest of all taxpayers and of society in general. It will always be in the benefit of the recipient, but that is not the question that those of us interested in or involved with public policy should be asking. Um, on the cost and scale of tax expenditure, Chair, there are a number of ways of assessing the cost of a tax expenditure. The most intuitive is to estimate the immediate reduction in revenue to the state associated with the introduction of the measure, known as the revenue foregone method. This is generally estimated by comparing the revenue expected under the current structure versus the revenue expected when the tax expenditure is in place. In general, this assumes no change in the behaviour of individuals or firms and as such can give an exaggerated estimate of the cost of an expenditure. However, it remains the most straightforward and most common international way of estimating tax expenditure costs. One could spend a long time exploring the minutiae of possible behavioural change and possible long-term benefits and or costs of a particular tax expenditure measure, but it would suggest sticking with the established revenue foregone method and noting that the cost it provides may somewhat exaggerate the final cost. The information available to the Select Committee and to Irish society in general regarding tax expenditure measures has increased dramatically over the last decade. When the Commission on Taxation commenced its work, there was limited information on the annual costs, but this has transformed following the work of the Commission, revisions to the scale of information on tax ex expenditures published by the Revenue Commissioners, annual reports from the Department of Finance, and requirements at a European level that all countries report on the nature and scale of the tax resources they decide not to collect each year via tax expenditure. As such, there is a new opportunity for committees such as this to engage with what was heretofore an inaccessible area of budgetary policy and resource allocation. The most recent list of tax expenditures from the Revenue Commissioners lists a total of 120 tax relieving measures. Uh, of these, I would classify approximately 106 measures as discretionary and the total cost of these measures in revenue foregone of uh, 21.4 billion euro per annum. In many cases, these measures are generally regarded as worthwhile and many do not need review, for example, tax credits for individuals, couples, PAYE and self-employed workers. Others are discretionary but have long-standing policy support tax relief on child benefit payments, tax relief on nursing home expenses, tax relief on rent or room income, while others are discretionary and can be argued for and against, for example, mortgage interest relief, income tax reduction measures for high income foreign executives. Uh, Chairman, I would encourage the Select Committee to engage as follows with the issue. First, uh, I would suggest to the Committee it should request the Department of Finance to finalise a list of tax expenditure measures which are not part of the baseline, i.e. the technical functioning of the tax system, and that they provide a report with the cost of these measures in revenue foregone terms to the Select Committee each year.
Second, requests that the Revenue Commissioners publish their annual tax expenditure cost data in a format that aligns with the list established by the Department of Finance. This is likely to require the Revenue Commissioners to classify the tax relieving measures they report upon into groups, including discretionary tax expenditures, benchmark tax relieving measures, tax credits and allowances. Third, given the scale of the resources involved, uh, I believe the Select Committee should review this list and the changes to its costs on an annual basis. Even if all discretionary tax expenditure measures are worthwhile, it is of merit for a committee like this, on behalf of the Oireachtas, to have oversight of the nature and distribution of those resources. Fourth, the Select Committee should engage each year with the Department of Finance following the publication of various reviews of tax expenditure as part of the material which accompanies the annual budget. Likewise, the Committee should engage with other researchers who have examined tax expenditure issues. Uh, for example, over the past uh, two years, Professor Jerry Hughes and I have undertaken a detailed examination of the cost distribution and policy options around the large amount of recurring annual tax expenditure granted to support private pension savings. Uh, fifth, the committee should select a theme each year and review the merits of each of the tax expenditure measures currently in existence under that scheme. Approaching the list of items in this way makes them more accessible and the exploration more intuitive. The Commission on Taxation adopted the following categories to its assessment and I suggest the committee should take a similar approach. Uh, they are children, housing, health, philanthropy, enterprise including farming, employment, savings and investment and others. In addition to this list I would add capital allowances as an area of deserving of particular focus given the resources involved. Uh, finally, Chair, the Committee should also review the case made in the Budget and Finance Bills and in the associated documentation for the introduction of each new tax expenditure. Both the Commission on Taxation and the Department of Finance have provided a useful set of criteria to assess the appropriateness of new measures and it would be appropriate for a committee such as this to consider if the measures as proposed and designed adhere to those criteria. Uh, finally, Chair, uh, the decision of the Select Committee to focus on this issue is most welcome. As mentioned by the Commission on Taxation, the OECD and others, resources allocated to tax expenditure are equivalent to resources allocated to direct expenditure. Given that, there is a long overdue need for detailed Oireachtas oversight of these decisions. Indeed, it was a recommendation of the Commission on Taxation, and I hope the Committee embraces the opportunity to provide greater insight and democratic oversight of this area of public policy. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Collins. Just um, a couple of brief observations. Um, when you're talking about the amounts um, allocated on, on tax expenditure, in the ballpark, it, it, it's ranging from between 10 and 20 percent. Is that kind of uh, internationally the norm uh, from your experience, or we both that or below that? Uh, we're not alone as a country in not giving enough detail to this and uh, our detailed focus to this. So, in fact, making comparisons internationally remains quite challenging um, uh, and uh, often boils down to uh, you know, quite technical decisions as to what we do and do not count as part of uh, the overall suite of tax expenditure. Um, the uh, Irish uh, figures are. I would say mid to high from my experience relative to uh, other countries. But we are similar to other countries in not asking questions about whether we should retain them or not. Um, uh, and it's been interesting to look at the evolution of policy in other countries over time uh, who have begun to give more focus to analysing the scale of these expenditures and then you know, concluding as to whether they should retain them or uh, adapt them or continue them uh, or not. So uh, I think it's, um, uh, we're about mid-table, I would say, mid-table plus in terms of or where we would sit uh, internationally. I'm going to come to Deputy Bruin there. One of the, I mean, you made a number of, of recommendations and we'll be certainly looking at them. Uh, one of them that you refer or reference is um, requesting the Department of Finance to finalise a list of tax expenditures measures which are not part of the baseline. We understand they're doing that and have almost completed that, so that's something to take away. I, th I think that would be very helpful to the committee and I think, uh, that w I think one of the challenges is that in a sense the Revenue Commissioners produce a large amount of information 
um, uh, and uh, it, it would be helpful to take what might be accepted as a, 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 a comprehensive list of the tax, discretionary tax expenditures in place uh, and then to have a recurring list of that from the Department of Finance. I think that would help the, this committee in particular in its work in terms of its examination. Um, and then uh, if I can point to one of my other uh, uh, suggestions there, which might be to then encourage the revenue commissioners to produce their data in a way that aligns to the, um, uh, the, the typology that the Department of Finance uh, establishes. Uh, Chair, if I can just uh, add one point to that as well, which is in the report of the Commission on Taxation as part of uh, the uh, work we did, uh, well, well, simply we started with no list at all, so we had to go and compile a list um, uh, of all the tax relieving measures and then within that to disaggregate what we felt was in the baseline and what we felt were the, in effect, discretionary tax expenditure that's there. Um, uh, having done that, we, you know, we got to a set of items that we reviewed, uh, but we were very clear in saying, and uh, I, I would encourage the committee to, to reflect on this, that if it is the case that a baseline set of tax measures are established, in other words, we, we take a view that there are certain measures which are there as the norm to facilitate the functioning of the tax system. Um, that that's a list we should review, um, because in a sense there can be debates and arguments over that as well. However, it would be good to start with a list and then a, a committee like this can return to review it in time, and I think that would be a significant step forward. Okay. Uh, Deputy Brown. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Look, and I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor uh, Collins and uh, to thank you for your very informative uh, briefing and um, the fact that there obviously is a good bit of work uh, happening in the um, in the academic sphere on this subject, which is, uh, I've always thought was the most important area uh, from the very first finance bill I ever looked at, because um, there were lots of uh, tax expenditures that nobody gave the, in, the, in that era in the early 90s, gave the slightest attention to actually costing. Um, and do you think uh, that, say, if there is a new tax expenditure then, uh, for example, the recent, a lot of the debate about uh, climate uh, mitigation measures, about a tax and dividend approach, that there should be a rigorous costing of such an approach of, of how it would be done. Uh, the, that's first of all. And secondly, just in relation to the, the 21.4 billion, I mean, it's an astonishing figure, really. Um, it, it, can you break that down into, therefore, what would be, you know, our PBO in their paper estimated uh, the figure at around five billion plus? Um, can you can you do the, you say the last group there, their discretionary can be argued for and against? for example, mortgage tax uh, interest relief and so on. So um, can you break it down into, if you like, um, uh, discretionary measures, which you know we, we kind of take for granted, like the, the personal tax credits and so on, and then those which perhaps need, uh, you know, like capital loans, as you mentioned uh, later in your contribution, that we need to, to, to look at. Um, uh, obviously, the, 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 in relation to reviews of them, um, we, we got the Department of Finance's um, review of a number of expenditures. Uh, I think it, was, it wasn't actually on budget day, it was the day after the budget, which is very unsatisfactory. And um, like, uh, should should every tax expenditure have a sunset clause first of all, and have a review? You know, in other words, have, a, have be, be time be time framed, and and, and uh, you know that we know at some stage we're going to do a rigorous uh, review of it. Um, and uh, just on the international front, our colleagues here, our colleagues at the committee, I think, and the PBO did uh, some work for us in relation to the UK and some questions we had about the UK and uh, indeed other ones. In fact, when I was uh, about this time last. Last year, I raised uh, the issue with Taoiseach Varadkar, and uh, you know he gave me a long list of the, the kind of simple discretionary um, expenditures, and kind of said, "You're not going to withdraw these, are you? Like these, you know, th these are critical to families and so on and so forth." But you didn't really get into the, the, the core point. But I mean, I noticed when I was, when I was doing that that countries like France and uh, I think Italy, for example, seem to have spectacular um, tax expenditures that no one seemed to know really, or you might be talking about, I don't know, 10% of GDP or something. Um, and, and I know the UK, the UK seems to be ahead of the ball game in relation to this compared to our performance. Um, and yeah, I mentioned sunset clauses, should they all have sunset clauses and be rigorously um, you know, assessed by this committee and by the Dáil? Thanks, Kirk. Uh, thanks, Deputy. I'll, I'll see if I can remember all those I worked through them. Uh, uh, firstly, I, I agree with you in terms of um, finance bills, which is really very much the focus for, for tax expenditure. So 
Uh, sometimes they get mentioned on budget day, but really the detail for these measures appears in finance bills, yeah. either as new tax expenditures or as extensions to tax expenditure. Yeah. Um, uh, and so uh, yeah, I think it's very welcome that a committee like this is, is in place, which is the opportunity uh, over time to look at, examine and reflect upon uh, those uh, decisions. Uh, as the, uh, the members will know well, uh, that whole budgetary process tends to happen very, very rapidly. Yeah. Um, and I think it's great to have a, a space such as this to uh, allow some uh, reflection uh, on that. Uh, you know, just as easily as we're happy to create tax expenditures, we should be able to take them away uh, if that's the, the case too. It clearly is almost more difficult to take things away, particularly when there are people benefiting from them. Yeah. Um, uh, but nonetheless, we should be able uh, to, uh, to do so. Um, uh, I think on your point on the sort of potential for new measures um, uh, that are coming in, I, I think we, the, the ideal uh, is that we would reflect upon those before we adopt them. In other words, we would align them to the uh, criteria that either the Commission on Taxation uh, and the, the suggestions that the Commission made there influenced quite heavily the criteria that the Department of Finance subsequently put together. And I note a very good summary of all of that in the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, document uh, that they produced recently. Um, uh, but certainly we should be thinking about uh, the, uh, the potential costs of anything, the uh, likely effectiveness of them. Uh, the reality is when we introduce a, a tax expenditure, uh, it, it is uh, you know, there's an inequity inherent in it in that you are reducing the tax that uh, one individual or company or whatever is paying relative to equivalent individuals who are not in a position to avail uh, of that tax break. So we need to be pretty clear if we're doing that that it is worthwhile doing it and that yeah. very much brings us back to are the overall benefits to society greater than the costs and so I think those questions need to be asked. Um, at times you can argue that uh, if, those, if there isn't enough time to ask those questions in the run-up to a budget, and I, I accept these things can happen quite rapidly at times, uh, well, then there's no reason why we can't return to them shortly afterwards as the schemes get up and running and begin to uh, analyse and assess as to whether they work or not or whether they are worth continuing uh, or not. In that sense, I, I would, uh, one of your later points, agree with the fact that we should always have a sunset clause on every tax expenditure and indeed that was the recommendation of the Commission taxation. Um, but we should also build in uh, whether it is, in a sense, the most brilliant tax expenditure in the world that makes absolutely perfect sense, we should still review it to be certain that it is. Um, and, and therefore, as well as having a sunset clause, there should be a built-in mechanism for review uh, to uh, all of these tax expenditures uh, on, on a recurring uh, basis. Um, I'd be happy if, if the Chair would allow me to come back to the committee with, with a more comprehensive answer to your request to break down the, yeah. the tax expenditure into um, uh, which of them are, um, uh, well, well just to explain my, the, the 21 billion euro figure firstly, I mean I would regard that as all items that are discretionary. So you know we, we have in a budget, so maybe the least discretionary in there might be, for example, personal tax credits for PAY workers or self-employed workers or whatever the case is. Um, uh, but of course they're discretionary because we can change them at budget time, generally upwards, uh, but, but we can change them. Um, uh, and uh, uh, clearly we could decide it would be quite a, a major thing to do to alter them rather dramatically if we wish to as well. So they are discretionary, but as you mentioned, they're maybe a little bit less discretionary than the ones that uh, have uh, that are a bit more controversial, you might think, as having full discretion. I'm very happy to come back to the Chair if, if I'm if permitted to do that and, and to provide a, a more comprehensive breakdown okay. uh, on that uh, as well. Um, uh, just on your... Uh, your, one of your final comments then when we look at other countries, uh, the, the comparisons cross-country are really very difficult. The OECD have had attempts to, to do this. They did a report in 2010 which made some comparisons um, and subsequently um, a paper from Mary Walsh and I, we were both members of the Commission Taxation, uh, sort of slotted Ireland into that comparison to see where we were. But um, the, uh, the, the great difficulty with sort of taking the headline figures from France or Germany or other countries is very much what they count and how they count it and that can give you quite misleading 
um, comparative figures uh, to, to make. And it actually comes back to internationally a sort of problem for our tax systems, which is that these tax expenditures have appeared and grown over time, and as they grow, that's become um, we haven't watched them enough, uh, and we haven't watched to see if they work, and if, uh, and, and in a sense, understand the distributive aspects of them and the uh, appropriateness or not of their erosion of fairness, which is ultimately uh, the structure and what they do. This feeds very much into a common theme of the work of the Budgetary Oversight Committee in the last year, uh, whether it comes to gender budgeting, whatever. I'm intrigued. I mean, is there ever a case where a tax relieving measure is simply forgotten? Uh, it's, it's gathering dust and no one has it bothered to, they've forgotten it's there, they haven't interrogated it, and it's, um, it's costing the exchequer. Well, I, I, I think firstly, um, that probably was a pretty fair description of where the entire Irish taxation system was before the Commission of Taxation reported in 2009, and that we, in a sense, had all of these tax measures there. Um, and um, we um, didn't in any well, we didn't even have a list of them. So in a sense, that's sort of classic insight into um, uh, things being introduced and, and uh, uh, just fall, in, fall into place. And indeed, the uh, secretary to that commission uh, did some very hard work, having to go back to the bills that. Um, and move through the Oireachtas introducing those tax expenditures to gather up the list of them in the first place and then subsequently to um, gather the estimated costs if they were ever mentioned for it. Um, and that's why I said earlier I think we've come on in leaps and bounds and that by and large we have a comprehensive list now uh, which, uh, which I think puts a committee like this in a very strong position to be able to, uh, to, <coughs> to think about them. Um, but I, you know, I, the the add-on step from having a list is we need to look at the list and think about the list, and so that's certainly where I would encourage the committee to begin to engage with that. Uh, there is no reason to, to come back to your gender budgeting point at the start, where we couldn't think about some of the other objectives that uh, these have, uh, and uh, uh, I'm coming to personally the end of a piece of work which looks at the gendered aspects around uh, the pension tax breaks that we give, which when finished I'm happy to pass on to the committee okay, as well. Terrific. Deputy Boyd Barrett. Thanks, uh, Chair, Deputy Lahart, uh, and thanks to Dr Collins for uh, coming in and let me say I welcome the fact that you welcome <laughs> the, the, our focus on, on this. Um, uh, because I, I think it's a, an area that really everybody needs to be thinking about more. Uh, I wish there was more media attention, frankly, for it. I mean, there's huge debate about direct expenditures in the budget. There's almost none about what is a huge uh, amount of money uh, that could be used for other things that is going out uh, in tax expenditures which many of which, at least arguably in layman's terms, could be described as tax loopholes. Now, that, it's controversy, you know, controversial. Certainly some of them, I think, are. But it, at the very least, whatever you may think about some of these expenditures, they should be scrutinised, and they're not. It's like a hidden, I would go as far as to say it's a sort of hidden economy uh, that nobody really is focusing on. And because sometimes it's a bit shrouded in kind of technical language and stuff, uh, it, it, people don't pay much attention to it or don't understand it. While I'm here, I, I would actually shout out to the media to actually scrutinise this stuff and, and pay the same attention this committee, I hope, will pay to it because there's a, there's a lot of really important stuff. So I, I, I very much welcome your uh, initial comments. But a, couple of, a few questions I have for you. First of all, about establishing the scale, extent of tax expenditures, what tax expenditures exist. And you say 21 billion uh, could arguably be described as discretionary, and that's huge um, uh, and needs to be scrutinised, and I hope this committee will scrutinise it. But I just wonder, is it bigger than that? Um, you know, I, at the last committee, I don't know if you got to see it, I just, you know, you know, I'm not an accountant like you, and so you can maybe give your opinion, a more expert opinion on this. But just in the corporate tax 
area, which is one I'm particularly interested in. There, uh, I showed a table that was provided uh, fr based on revenue figures by Seamus Coffey in his report on um, corporate taxation. And for the year 2015, which is the last available figure when he produced the thing, the pre-tax gross profits were 144 billion. But by the time allowances and deductions were uh, allowed for, the taxable profit came down to about 70 billion. And the actual tax collected was about 7 billion. Okay, now, uh, on a straight line calculation, that means 12.5% is a total fantasy. There's no 12.5% corporate tax rate. Uh, but it, but it, similarly, on a sort of very straight line basis, that means there was about 77 billion worth of corporate tax reliefs and credits and deductions and allowances, uh, which is a lot more than 21 billion. Um, so I'd like you to give your kind of understanding of that. Uh, the explanation that we got the last time is, well, some of those are just part of the tax base. And I think that's maybe what you referred to there in your introduction, that they're part of the administration of the tax system. They're not really, uh, they're not really um, uh, discretionary uh, tax uh, expenditures. But I, I have to question that a little bit, about how we, how we make that distinction. Um, so you, for example, cited in your introduction, you said, I think you talked about intergroup transactions as an example of something that's administrative, it's not really discretionary. But then I look at the revenue table for 216 as against 215. And intergroup transactions as a tax relief jumped from 2.9 billion to 9 billion in one year. Now I think to myself, that's not administrative. There's something else going on there where intergroup transactions and their ability of the fir those firms who are doing those transactions goes in one year from 2 billion to 9 billion. I, my guess is that's got something to do with the big IT companies um, moving around uh, royalties on intellectual property. So it's not just administrative. It's actually a huge loophole, potentially at least, that needs to be scrutinised. So I just wouldn't mind your kind of comment on that. Uh, and, and do you think that corporate area is one that really we need to heavily scrutinise? Um, because, you know, I mean, I, it seems to me in my kind of observations and indeed certain allegations that have been made to me by people in the film industry, for example, we talked about this last week, that some of the stuff that is, uh, you know, that costs are being massively inflated in certain circumstances in order to uh, benefit from tax reliefs, to draw down tax reliefs. But uh, to what extent are we checking whether those are legitimate expenditures and allowances and whether that needs to be heavily scrutinised but it's just being taken as, ah, sure, we've been doing this for years so we're not going to... You know, we don't need to look at that. We'll just look at the ones that were done in the last few budgets. Wait, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Deputy. Again, I'll see if I can pick uh, all of those up. Firstly, can I agree with you at the very start in, in, ter in terms of the dramatic difference in uh, focus that direct expenditure gets versus, the, the, in effect, the hidden expenditure yeah. that goes through uh, the uh, to, to the decision not to collect taxes. And um, I, I've been uh, long of the view that uh, uh, committees like this need to exist to, to, to look at those issues. Uh, and I think it would be a significant step forward if we get to a point where there's a clear Department of Finance report and a clear Revenue Commissioner's report on a recurring basis so that uh, people in positions such as yourself are free to ask questions uh, on behalf of those who elect you to, uh, to this institution uh, uh, as to the use of that, uh, those resources and because clearly there are always alternatives uh, to it. So uh, your point of it being a hidden economy I think is fair and, and there's certainly an opportunity now to cast more light on that and I hope that uh, opportunity uh, is, uh, is grasped. Um, 
On the, uh, um, briefly on the very last point that you uh, made um, before I get to your core point, uh, it's interesting when you engage at times with uh, accountants and others who were around uh, you were involved in some way on the administration of various tax expenditures, mm -hmm. whether they're the very big corporate ones or whether they're quite small ones like film relief or mm -hmm. what other, well, mm -hmm. not that that's too small, but anyway, mm -hmm. or the other ones you go to. Um, uh, one of the, the arguments that's made uh, is that uh, we don't want to place an administrative burden on the recipients of these tax expenditures and therefore we'll collect as little information as possible. Uh, and certainly, personally, my response to that is generally that, well, if you compare that to the rather extensive forms we require, we require people to fill out to get, say, social welfare entitlements, uh, much smaller amounts of money generally to social welfare entitlements, and I know deputies such as yourselves will be more than familiar with that in yeah. terms of your constituency works. Um, and there's really no reason why we shouldn't be collecting proper and detailed information uh, on uh, the uh, whoever, whatever the tax expenditure is uh, that's being availed of. And in effect, the more information we get, the more able we will be uh, generally to, to assess the uh, effectiveness of them, the value for money, uh, and so on as well. Uh, and in that sense, clearly, it's impossible that, or sorry, it's important that we uh, visit uh, existing tax expenditures that continue to roll on as well as think about new ones and so as well as sunset clauses we need to think about those uh, sort of uh, recurring reviews. Um, the, the, whole, uh, the whole corporate tax issue is, uh, I would certainly think, one where this committee has, has another clear role uh, as well. Um, uh, you know, looking on uh, on that whole topic uh, uh, generally, I would say uh, that uh, in terms of uh, again, I mentioned sort of issues around the stability of the taxation system in some of my in my uh, opening comments, uh, and uh, one would have thought the. Uh, very short-term behaviour of the corporate sector is skewing the stability of the Irish tax system now and uh, while that tends to give us quite positive figures in the short term, uh, if it were to invert or reverse in whatever way it could cause us very significant problems and it is really a strategic threat uh, to the, the overall budgetary structure, uh, the structure of the taxation system um, and uh, the economy. Um, I'm a member of the, of the um, National Competitiveness Council and one of the points I make to my colleagues on that council on a regular basis is the potential for Ireland to have a very severe paper recession uh, where some strange a set of decisions happen in a corporate tax board or corporate boardroom, uh, which would have no enormous uh, knock-on ramifications for uh, the Irish economy uh, and, and all the various metrics we use for it. And there's a real uh, danger uh, to that, and uh, that that whole issue uh, is is problematic. Uh, over the last. Um, year and a bit, I was quite struck in that context by the work of the Comptroller and Auditor General's office, who really for the first time uh, for as long as I've been looking at taxation issues on the Irish economy, got to the bottom of how much um, tax is being paid by corporates. Now, uh, it was maybe not in their remit to, to uh, begin to think in minute detail about the way in which corporates behave, a point I want to come back to, uh, but nonetheless they provided a really important report uh, um, the year before last, uh, which was a chapter in their annual report, uh, which uh, went through the actual or the effective tax rates that uh, corporates were paying. Um, and, you know, the story there, when we look at Irish business, which they illustrated very clearly in their, um, in their report, is that the, uh, that by and large, the vast majority of firms, many of which are very small in any event, are paying in and around 12.5%, um, as you would expect, and clearly neither have the resources nor the ability to avail of whatever evasion measures or tax management measures or whatever that are there, uh, but that there's a very small number of very large corporate firms uh, which are, uh, I, which are uh, using the system in such a way uh, that they pay uh, a, a surprisingly low, if any at all, uh, tax, um, uh, tax contribution. Um, and in fact, some of them were paying negative. Uh, in other words, they were getting refunds. Um, so we, uh, the, the tax system was paying them. Um, uh, and uh, I thought that was an eye-opening insight into, uh, into that whole area. Uh, it sort of shines a light on the fact that probably in corporate tax 
terms, there are a small handful of firms who are playing the system uh, and giving, you, giving us all some quite skewed outcomes. And of course, in many cases, they are large international firms, and, as, and I think you're, you're right to point out that um, there are remarkable differences between, in a sense, the incomes they uh, initially receive and then subsequently the, the final income that's available uh, to be taxed. And that, of course, brings us back to the very interconnected international context that, that they uh, operate in. Um, I think when you stand back from that, I think we would be an awful lot more upset as a country about those issues and the behaviour of those corporates uh, if we were on the other end of the, um, of the spectrum. In other words, in a sense, we are getting some tax resources out of this, unexpectedly large tax resources currently uh, out of it. Um, uh, and it's welcome that the Department of Finance and others have come around to acknowledge that in the last, uh, last couple of months. Um, but uh, clearly, if we are, others aren't. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's become a challenge among our European colleagues, uh, among others as well. Uh, and uh, I think we are, uh, I would think, in a, in a sensible way, moving internationally towards a restructuring of the way in which corporates are allowed to behave. And to a great degree, we write those rules as countries and, and yourselves as legislators that write those rules. Um, uh, and I think we need to know an awful lot more. If there's a hidden economy in Ireland, that's probably the big part of the hidden economy. Um, huge flows in and out of the state. Um, and um, to a degree often to the disadvantage, not so much of us, because we seem to be getting some taxation revenue from it, but for other countries who are losing out, and uh, whether they are developing world countries in the extreme context, or whether they are some of our fellow developed world and maybe European uh, member states, or indeed fellow OECD member states, uh, you know, there is an issue there which uh, I, I would expect will have to be resolved over the next couple of years and will probably have an impact on the level of tax revenue that we continue to collect as a country. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Do you want to come back in with anything, Richard? Yeah, I, I would. Do, you, do you think just, you know, when you said, and I absolutely agree with you, that for every tax expenditure, that is money that could be spent in a different way, on the same sector or on something completely different? Do you think as part of, a, like, really proper scrutiny, there needs to be a kind of comparison done on that, you know, to... To take two that we looked at recently, research and development, uh, I think it's, what's it up to now, 700 million a year? Is it 700 million a year, the R&D tax credit? Huge, right? Nearly a billion euro and has jumped significantly. Uh, and that is overwhelmingly going to benefit that same small group of multinationals that we were talking about. Uh, they're the ones who benefit most from it. Now, to my mind, in order to assess whether that is good uh, use of public money or not, what, one of the things you'd need to do is say, well, what would happen if we took 700 million and invested it in public universities for research purposes? Which would, which would generate a better impact for Irish society, Irish economy, and research and development and innovation? Now, to me, it's a no-brainer. If you put 700 million to our universities, it would be far better than giving 700 million to Apple, Google, and Facebook uh, in terms of the impact on develop stimulating our own economy and a more sustainable economy. But that's just my view. But wouldn't it be, you know, sh would you agree that that's the sort of comparison or one of the sort of things that we need to look at? Or similarly, the, uh, on film, uh, I think in total, Section 481 has probably in its existence, has involved about 1.7 billion euro going out to the film industry uh, over that time, about 80 to 90 million a year between the various uh, sources. And, and yet we've then discovered that you know, there were claims that there were 17,000 jobs in the Irish film sector. When it was actually scrutinised and challenged, it's come down to 2,000. And you could add to that, well, 1.7 billion over 10 years Where's the infrastructure? What does the state own for the 1.7 billion? We don't have any studios that we own. We don't have any, we've nothing. There's absolutely nothing. So we've hardly any jobs and we've hardly any infrastructure. So what exactly did we get for our money? Now, it, 
you know, now there's other people who will say, oh, we got something, we got a, a number of films made, maybe, right? And, you know, let them put that argument, sure. But you could certainly, as a useful way of kind of comparing, what well, is that a good expenditure, is a bad expenditure, what would have happened or what would happen if instead we invested that money in building a, a public studios and employing people directly to make films and, you know, if we did it that way, would that actually have more benefit? And th those are just two examples that I can think of. But, you know, do you think that in general we need to look at those sorts of comparisons uh, in order to assess the effectiveness and the usefulness uh, of uh, tax expenditures? Thanks, Richard. Just to go back to Dr. Collins, going to take in Deputy Ryan as well. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Um, just if I can go back, I agree with Deputy Bruton, you need to look at every measure. And, and on that tax and dividend and carbon tax, we did look at the Department of Finance to look for a certain initial analysis uh, on the effect. And, and what they're showing, as I understand, the latest evidence on that is massive, or not massive, but, but clear uh, progressiveness in that lower income people benefit. Very clear. And that's backed up by decades of research by Sue Scott and others showing the same. So it, it does seem that it is a way of transferring from the wealthy to the poor in our society um, and all the research I've seen. But uh, Mr. Collins, I, I very much um, I remember your time in that, that, in that tax commission and the really good work it did. And um, as I recall, after one of the, in that depths of the crash period, 10, 2009, 2011, one of the changes that were put in was a significant uh, scaling back on all the tax expenditures that were available, particularly all those property, those that typically were availed, availed of by the wealthiest were the ones that were, are, are indeed, there were also, if I recall rightly, introduction of income limits and so on that, that, that really cut out the flagrant abuse of, of tax expenditures to favour the very wealthy in our society. And I'd be interested, is, is that a fair assessment of, of, of what happened in that, in that difficult period with, with tax expenditures? I'm also recalling at that time there was a recommendation or government agreed a proposal that we would standard rate the pension tax uh, expenditure break, which was probably was still one of the biggest of these discretionary. I mean, if there's two big ones left, it's probably pension and mortgage, uh, I'm guessing. My understanding is that never happened. And uh, I, I wonder if, if you have any history on why that was the case. Why did that? Uh, move. I, I recall it being agreed by government. I, I, I could be incorrect. Um, and I'm very interested in your work and concentration on that area of pensions contributions. Um, uh, my understanding in, in that report you've done, or you cited in your, in your opening presentation, was it, is it that the median beneficiary of, of ta pension tax break or of user of it is in the ninth decile that you know this, so, so it's very heavily skewed towards those in higher incomes uh, and I'd be very interested to uh, get a copy of that analysis you do on gender because um, I'm sure that will show a similar skewing um, I'm guessing in, in advance so that would be very timely for this committee to get the copy of that report when it comes in just in relation to that, given it's one of the one areas where we've got a large volume of tax expenditure at the moment, the government last March agreed a new, whole new system for, for kind of um, planning for and uh, managing our, our pension system, both in managing the state pension system, but also in, was it Strand 4 of their research work at that time said they'd look at how we would incentivise and support defined benefit contributions and so on. I don't recall within that announcement or in that time that there was any commitment to reviewing the tax expenditures for pension contributions. Were you approached or, or, or were you engaged or have you looked at that process or do you think that, I mean, my, is that a 2018 to 2025 or it's the next two or three years that they, I guess the kind of some of the measures such as obligatory um, Country, oh well, you'd have to do an opt-out for, for, for a defined bench. Surely that provides a mechanism for our moment for us to consider reform and review and removal, maybe, or uh, certainly adjustment or lowering down of the pension, the pension, the tax breaks we give on, on pension contributions, given from the analysis you cite, is, it's clearly very it's not progressive, and, and it may be gender-biased uh, as well. Uh, is there any developments in that regard that, that you can inform us? Or, and do you think the committee, if we're looking for maybe a recommendation in, in the upcoming budget, 
um, might be able to use that analysis to, to, to make a suggestion to the Minister of Finance that he does do something to, to change that, that pension contribution tax break. Thank you, Deputy Ryan. Uh, Dr. Collins. Uh, okay, I think, Chair, um, uh, just rapidly to pick up on, on Deputy Boyd Barrett's uh, points first. Um, the, uh, I suppose the bottom line in every examination of tax expenditure, and indeed it's it, it, one of the first recommendations of the Commission on Taxation in that area, was to say that direct expenditure is the, always the better route. So, you know, if we're thinking of doing something, you should do the direct expenditure route because it's clear. You can see it, uh, as indeed you mentioned in your earlier contribution, we look at that in a far more clear way because, in a sense, we record it in a far more clear way. So it is always the better route to go. Um, uh, then there can, so really one has to make an argument as to why one will mm. do something via the tax system rather than via direct expenditure. And actually the, the economic crisis over the last com couple of years has come, come to help in that a little bit because prior to the economic crisis the view was well you can do it through the tax expenditure because nobody notices uh, mm. and because it doesn't count to a degree. I mean yeah. if in a sense you're deciding not to collect tax and so it wasn't being counted as either spending, it was the equivalent of spending, but it wasn't being counted. Um, the uh, economic uh, recession and um, the sort of various changes across all European countries and the various fiscal rules at European level and so on have, have sort of brought all countries, including ourselves, to a point where we need to count everything, whether we, whether we are doing it through spending or tax expenditure. Uh, and that's helpful in terms of uh, bringing a greater clarity to it. Um, I think it's probably fair to say not all European countries are there yet, given the, some of the earlier comments we had, uh, just in terms of what is a tax expenditure and so on. But we've come on in leaps and bounds, and I think you know, we can continue to, uh, to do that. Um, I'm sure my colleagues at UCD would love me to say we should take all the research and development tax money uh, that uh, we could possibly uh, get and, and bring it in. Uh, I, but, you know, I, I think... If, uh, uh, to be very dispassionate about it, I mean, if, it's the, if the research and development tax credit makes sense, well, then we should have a report to show us that it makes sense. Um, and I know there has been one or two, or firstly, that has been continually tweaked since it's been uh, introduced. Um, and there are some strange structures to it where uh, corporates are getting uh, refunds of unused credits and so on as well. So there's certainly potential to, to change within that as well. Um, but uh, it's a very expensive tax relief which is continuing to, to grow. Uh, there is what I suppose we economists would always refer to as dead weight within it. In other words, there are things that it's helping to happen or are things that are happening and are being claimed that are happening uh, because of the research and development tax credit, which would probably happen blame, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so really it is interesting to begin to analyze those. And if you look at the whole area of, say, enterprise support generally, the, the assumption for dead weight by the Department of um, uh, Enterprise um, would be somewhere in the order of 75 to 80 percent anyway. So therefore, you, uh, it's a very small uh, additional gain that's coming there, and therefore the question is whether it's worthwhile or not. So I think it, it would be good to see some mm -hmm. uh, potential for that. And I suppose for a committee like this, it's interesting to look at that as an area where you know, it didn't exist a few years ago, and it now costs 700 million euro per annum. And if that, well, you know, maybe that's money well spent or not, but mm -hmm. it would be useful to have a coherent uh, answer uh, to uh, to that as well. And similarly, with with the film relief, the um, yeah, certainly for a long time, the the argument for film relief has been around the employment it created. So mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the precise details of the figures, but if it is the case that that employment is uh, far less than expected or far more precarious than it might be or whatever the case is, well then that should throw up questions. And again, I think we'll come back to the point uh, that we should be continuing to revisit these tax expenditure measures uh, every couple of years. And uh, in thinking about that, that's why I felt there might be merit for the committee in terms of approaching something like this thematically every so often so that it, it picks a theme and goes to it and then comes back a couple of years later uh, to, to that similar theme that would give an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to, to gather the information in the interim and to, uh, to engage with them in that way. Um, uh, on Deputy uh, Ryan's uh, points, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see where it goes with the, with the carbon tax in terms of that. Yes, the, the um, um, evidence anyway, as you'll be aware, is that I uh, suppose expenditure on uh, fuel, etc., is a much greater component of lower income households. Um, expenditure and uh, therefore um, a carbon tax is likely to hit them harder and so therefore uh, as Sue Scott has shown for a long time there are good mechanisms in place where we can address that. 
uh, and uh, offset some of those uh, those costs. Um, the, uh, and so if we're going to make further steps in that area, then clearly there's those issues to do that. We may very well do that more likely through the direct expenditure route, in other words, through welfare payments or some other mechanism. But, but there, you know, there are choices to be made uh, uh, by uh, yourselves and others uh, on that. Um, uh, you're right to say that um, you know, post, uh, uh, I suppose, in tandem with the um, economic recession, the collapse of exchequer finances and the Commission taxation report uh, all at the same time, there were some very welcome changes made. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the, a lot of the property reliefs, which um, as I think we continue to see in many cases, were reliefs that were in place to allow people to minimize their tax bills rather than necessarily to provide assets that we needed uh, in any serious way for, for the state. Um, that uh, those uh, were, were abolished. Uh, therefore, in fact, when the Commission sat, it, it didn't, we didn't directly review them because, in a sense, they didn't exist. But we decided we would look at them anyway, mainly to make the point, and we did look at them, but to make the point, <clears throat> which is in the Commission's report, um, that um, you know, this is really something we shouldn't be doing via the tax system. I mean, supporting the um, the developments of property in whatever ways isn't really an appropriate thing to do. To a great degree, actually, Ireland has written the textbook as to how not to do uh, property supports via the, uh, the tax system. It therefore remains a concern that often that's the default answer, even uh, to this day, when we begin to think about, well, how should we respond to shortages in this or shortages in that, and the sort of the default thing that we should do it via the, the taxation system. To a great degree, we've pointed, you know, we have as a country uh, proven that we can't do that. Um, and to their credit, Alan Barrett and others at the ESRI did, uh, I, I would think, one of the most straightforward economic reports I've seen for a very long time over the last couple of years, which, say, which in very simple terms showed this is not a good thing to do when using the, the, the tax system uh, to that, uh, in whatever way to, to support uh, property development doesn't, uh, it simply doesn't work out. And, um, um, that doesn't stop people proposing it, but I think it's important that that, that evidence is there. Um, the, the other thing you, you mentioned in passing was, the, um, uh, was I think, a very uh, sensible uh, development uh, during uh, that period as well, where there was a high earners restriction uh, introduced, so that put a limit on the proportion of uh, your, uh, uh, in, well, there was a minimum effective tax rate that you must pay when you're above particular thresholds. Now it's still actually relative, and that continues to exist, it's still uh, relatively generous compared to what a PAYE worker would pay on the same uh, income. Um, uh, but it, has at it did at least stop people uh, moving to a point where they were able to shelter the entirety uh, or most of their uh, uh, income from tax, which had been the case and grew really out of the uh, experience that uh, Deputy Brown mentioned earlier, where over a very short period, a whole suite of tax uh, measure, tax expenditure measures came in, and then they started to be managed really and used in that way. So that continues to exist, and that I think uh, is very helpful. Its structure is interesting. So, for example, uh, there not every. Uh, tax expenditure is subject to be counted for how much you're using to write against your tax. So pensions, which you mentioned, is not. Uh, so uh, you, uh, and there's an interesting question as to why it shouldn't be, why, why there shouldn't be an overall uh, calculation as to how much of your uh, income you are allowed to uh, offset in whatever way uh, through uh, various tax expenditure. Um, on, the, uh, on the, the pensions tax breaks, well, firstly, I'm very happy to provide to yourself and members of the committee any of the, the research uh, already in existence or as it, as it continues to come out uh, around that. Um, the, uh, you're right that the uh, government did propose in the, um, na in the 2009 national uh, plan, uh, I've forgotten precisely, the, the, in fact, the rescue plan for the state. Re recovery plan, I think. Uh, it might be the National Recovery Plan 2009. So that did include, uh, if, in effect, that plan was all about adjustments or finding money. Um, and uh, within that, the uh, plan indicated that uh, 750 million euro would be taken out of the overall uh, um, tax supports that were going into the, uh, the pension sector. Um, 
However, I think it left it open to say that the, the, uh, the government and indeed the subsequent government were open to finding alternative routes uh, to, to do that. And the, the history of that is in itself interesting because uh, what happened was that uh, uh, instead of the uh, so the, the, instead of the um, uh, tax rates being standardised, uh, the uh, result was a levy which was put on pension funds, uh, so that in effect um, uh, it was almost um, uh, existing pension savers and those who were already retired who started paying for it, rather than necessarily changing on, uh, the the flow of funds uh, and the tax relief from it into uh, pensions. Um, uh, and then that's subsequently been phased out uh, as well. Uh, it, it remains a very large area of tax expenditure, and yes, it's quite skewed uh, when you look at the relief. Um, uh, so the overall cost will be about 2.4 billion euro per annum to the state, uh, but um, then probably within that you could identify about 1.2 billion as something that you could easily change. I mean, technically you could change everything, but certainly there's easily changeable elements to it in terms of the rate of tax relief uh, in particular, which would be the largest part of that. Um, the, uh, I suppose that issue remains in play. Certainly our, uh, the research from uh, Jerry Hughes and I would point to the fact that when you look at, well, who benefits from that, that uh, as you said, I, mean, I thought one of the most stark things was that the, the middle beneficiary is in the ninth decile. So in other words, there's 50% above, 50% below that. And that in itself is quite stark. I'm really not aware of many other public policy measures that allocate resources in that way. Um, and we also showed in that study that um, the amount of contributions that people were putting into their pensions were on average quite small, um, as, uh, which would throw up effectiveness questions about, you know, we're encouraging people to save, we're, um, we have uh, really quite expensive mechanisms in place to assist them to save, but actually the vast majority of people are saving very little and therefore it's not really going to significantly boost their income in retirement. And that sort of throws up interesting issues. It certainly plays into the current set of reforms around auto-enrolment uh, and the reform of the pension system. Um, the Department of Finance, uh, the, the sort of structure of that system, uh, that reform uh, currently is a bit awkward actually in that the Department of Social Protection or Employment and Social Protection are designing the new auto-enrolment uh, scheme um, and um, but not really talking about costs, which would, I would, in my view, be a kind of a key area, because that's really the remit of the Department of Finance, Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, the Department of Finance did do a consultation recently on the reform of the, uh, the tax rates um, on, uh, on pensions, and I was one of a uh, number of people who would have contributed to that. Um, and um, uh, I suppose when you stand back from this, the, there is large, if the auto enrolment scheme proceeds as it's planned, there is large additional costs for the state associated with that. So the plan there is that the state will top up contributions um, uh, in effect by one third for every, I think it's for every uh, three euro you put in, the state will put in an extra euro, but it's something of that nature for the, the structure. It hasn't been finalized in any event. Um, uh, so clearly that's going to cost the state a lot of money in direct expenditure to do that. Um, uh, and uh, I would have, uh, and my estimates would put that at around four or five hundred million euro per annum will be the cost of that. Um, and uh, if the state is going to do that, uh, well then, you know, at, at, unless we change the tax expenditure side of it, that is really an extra, uh, well, a very large amount of additional resources the state would have to find on a recurring annual basis. And indeed, that would increase as the population would would age if we assume that the auto enrolment system operates successfully. Um, and I wouldn't have thought that's sustainable, uh, really. And so, therefore, I would expect that over the next uh, year and a bit, uh, we will move into some uh, you know, territory where we have to engage with the reform of that uh, tax break for pension contributions. Um, and, of course, it's provided at the, the marginal rate of tax. So if you're a lower income earner, you get it at 20 percent. If you're a higher income earner, you get it at 40 percent. That in itself is an inequity. Uh, there isn't actually much saving, as Jerry Hughes and I show, uh, from um, merging them to a uh, to a sort of midway rate. And really, if you want to um, uh, save, 
uh, money for the state which you might use in some other way in that sector uh, is really moving towards the standardization uh, of it. Um, that, it would seem that that's exactly the opportunity to move from a, a tax break to an expenditure approach. That opportunity lies in this new... And, when, and also, I suppose, it just, it's interesting you mentioned there that there's still not a limit in terms of tax, as I pension contributions, there, and that is still the get-out clause for a lot of very wealthy people. As I understand, they kind of you know, lump some massive payments into a pension, which, which you, can, you can do as a way of, uh, uh, of uh, getting a tax-free or reduced tax income uh, uh, at certain stages in your career. Um, when is it expected the Department of Finance would report in that consultation that you were engaged in in the tax expenditure side of, the, of that pension reform? Is that you would think that that, that would must be within the next year or so that they would be looking to make that switch, or, or it would seem to make much more sense politically if you are proposing a, a state top up that that's the time to do to to change the tax expenditure rules. Coming back after the fact. I mean, there's certain obvious equity in, in switching from one to the other. If, if I come back to you, uh, so just to say the yes, Deputy, there are some contributions for, uh, which are again relatively recent from that period we talked about earlier for overall pension contributions, but nonetheless it remains quite generous and for uh, higher income earners, your contributions into pensions um, cannot um, uh, are not counted as part of the overall limit that's there on, on, on the use of tax breaks. Um, uh, but they are very generous uh, pension contribution limits uh, as you move towards uh, retirement uh, age and uh, they tend to be percentages of income and of course if you've got a very high income therefore that's a much higher nominal figure. Um, the, uh, there, there are limits on the overall size of people's pension pots as well and again they're quite generous relative to um, well, relative to the experience of most people and relative to uh, what um, uh, the, the, the vast majority of individuals would even contemplate in terms of, of pension saving and pension provision. Uh, I'm not aware of the, the precise timing of the Department of Finance consultation, um, but uh, it's pretty clear we're in a period where uh, uh, pension issues are changing, which therefore is very relevant in terms of this pension tax expenditure. Um, if you take the two proposals that uh, are, well, the, the current tax expenditure structure for pensions that's in place and then simultaneously the, um, the, the proposal for auto-enrollment and a top-up, uh, at least at first glance, and the, the auto-enrollment proposal is a straw man proposal, in other words, it's just sketching it out and, and the detail will follow. Um, but the, the initial proposals would suggest that the top-up or support from the state for auto-enrollment payments would be proportionally smaller than the tax relief that's available uh, through the, uh, the existing tax relief system. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that inequity is sustainable uh, or acceptable. Um, and so it would seem to me one way or the other those, um, even if there's an intention to retain the tax relief support, in, uh, in tandem with the auto and Roman support uh, that uh, they would have to be of the same scale in terms of support that certainly wouldn't be possible to be inequitable. And then there's a very obvious question which I think you're right to ask as to whether we should not have two systems but one system and then a straight clear uh, state top up might be the, the better route. I would expect some strong um, pushback from the pensions industry uh, on that and as uh, Jerry Hughes and I show in our report uh, the, by a long, long way, the uh, participants in uh, pension savings are uh, earners at uh, the, the higher tax rate, uh, even when you compare it relative to the, the structure of employees across the, the two uh, income tax rates. So um, one would expect some pushback uh, from that, but there's, I think, an inevitability of some significant change there, uh, one way or the other, over the, uh, the next year. And you're right, uh, these are... Uh, very large resources that the state is allocating uh, in this way. And so, you know, there are interesting questions um, uh, which even stretch to questions as to whether it, you should, uh, like countries like New Zealand, for example, just get rid of the entire structure and boost the, uh, and provide a boost to the universal social pension. So there, there, are, there, are, there are many options there and, uh, and they involve very large amounts of resources and really the livelihoods of very large proportions of our population, not just now but in the decades to come. So uh, that's, I think, a very interesting key tax expenditure area which um, uh, will certainly be to the fore over the next uh, year.
Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, Deputy Chambers. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And I only have a couple of questions. And thank you, Dr. Collins. Just in relation to, to tax expenditures, are there any of the current tax expenditures that you think need to be prioritised in terms of re being reviewed? And can you just comment, how does Ireland compare internationally in terms of the scale and revenue foregone uh, with tax expenditures? You know, are we greater than, than, is, than is normal or than, than is average, or are we broadly in line with other uh, countries, similar countries? Do you want to ask all your questions? Or yeah, I have just two further questions. Yeah. In terms of, you mentioned earlier in response to, to Deputy Ryan around, um, I suppose, how to assess if money is being well spent. And I think with tax expenditures, because we don't collect the tax, it's in tax foregone, that we have a slightly different, I suppose, perception of that money and maybe a different relationship with it. It's, it's different when you collect mm. revenues and then you expend that money on behalf of the state. People, we, we scrutinise that quite closely. But with tax expenditures, we, we kind of just forget about it because it was never collected in the first place. In terms of, of assessing whether that money is, is well spent, how do we assess that? Have you any suggestions as to what type of criteria should be applied? Should we look at direct uh, job creation as a result of this tax expenditure? Should we look at maybe spin-off industries that result from that? Or what kind of criteria should we use to assess if that money is well spent? And then in terms of, you, you, in response to Deputy Boyd Barrett, he spoke around some of the R&D may have happened anyways, with, with or without a particular tax credit or tax expenditure. I suppose, how do we close off or how do we, I mean, abuse is the wrong word of, of this very generous offer from government. How do we encourage maybe the, for example, the R&D, how do we encourage that which would not happen ordinarily without this particular assistance, but not have it used in such a way that it funds expenditure that would have happened anyways, or research that would have happened anyways. How do you think we might close off those loopholes? Deputy Chambers, Dr. Collins. Uh, uh, thank you, Deputy. Um, so just briefly at the start to say Ireland, I, I think would sit, I mentioned this earlier, sit about mid-table, I, I, I would think in terms of other countries, but there's a real challenge in um, the way in which we define and count tax expenditures cross-country, and there isn't really a coherent uh, and consistent system. Uh, the OECD have tried, and I think they continue to try. Um, uh, but it, it therefore leaves us in, 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 you know, in a very sort of challenged way to have a coherent or a concrete answer to that. Nonetheless, it represents, if you, I think always the most useful comparison is to put the, the revenue foregone costs that we have available and that we have more and more of those now mm -hmm. and think about that as a proportion of the overall tax take. Yeah. Um, uh, by and large, I, I think um, uh, organizations like the Department of Finance, the Revenue Commissioners would be a little uncomfortable with individuals like me and perhaps yourselves uh, taking out your calculator and adding up the entirety of the costs and saying, well, they overall amount to X. Um, I note the Parliamentary Budget Office did that in their, in their report as well. Uh, to be honest, I don't see anything wrong uh, with that. I mean, uh, you can, the, the argument against it is that um, uh, if you were to abolish all these tax breaks overnight, all of that money would not come in, and I think that's a very fair argument and indeed a correct argument. Uh, but nonetheless, it gives us an insight into the scale of the tax write-offs that are in place currently uh, in the current system. So I would encourage you and others to be feel, feel free to uh, uh, you know, put those numbers uh, together because it gives us a scale of it. And then when you compare it relative to the overall tax take, it's a significant uh, figure and it's a significant uh, area. Uh, I remember looking at uh, the increase in expenditure in uh, Ireland over the, the period running up to the economic crash. Um, and um, there were various um, documents published showing that. Uh, but I sort of added into that, well, what was the increase in tax expenditure over that period? And of course, it was one of the biggest areas of expenditure that had grown over the period. But we don't look at it uh, because it's not revenue uh, that's flowing in and therefore it's less visible. But I think that's improved a lot. And I think uh, it's very useful that a committee like this exists and has the opportunity, I think, to focus on this area. To be very honest, uh, other than this committee, probably that focus won't happen. So I yeah. think that the committee has a really, as, as an institution, the committee is an important role uh, in that area and it is a big, big area of budgetary policy and therefore I would think a big area of budgetary oversight. Um, in terms of um, uh, tax expenditures to, uh, to look at, um, there's, if I can say, there's a couple that come to mind, but I, I could probably think about it longer, but just to, to, to pick a few out, I think clearly, as I mentioned to uh, 
in, in my uh, last set of answers, the, um, uh, the issue of the pension tax expenditures are pretty clear, and I think there's some, uh, even if we weren't in the midst of pension changes, I think there are interesting questions around the appropriateness or effectiveness uh, of uh, those measures, uh, given the scale of money involved. Um, uh, you know, there are small tax expenditures like the uh, SARP tax expenditure, that's uh, uh, the Special Assignee Relief uh, Program, I think that's the, the, the phrase. And so that is aimed at uh, foreign executives based in Ireland on incomes of more than €75,000. So it is from that that you begin to get a reduction in your tax. So we are very much among the highest earners uh, in the state, uh, to, uh, who are resident in the state at least, for whom we are giving um, a tax relief. Uh, generally from uh, quite um, uh, profitable uh, international companies who are employ employing them. Uh, and of course it's a, a very attractive thing to uh, offer as a, an incentive and I'm sure the recipients of it are delighted to uh, receive it. I think anybody uh, who was in a position to receive something like that would be. Um, but it's questionable as to whether, uh, I would at least have questions as to whether that's really, uh, would all of those um, uh, individuals leave Ireland or not be replaced by uh, similar or equivalent people uh, if that uh, support was not in place. And, and uh, so we should ask those questions because that's really the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom line uh, for that. And it's, it, it's also got very small take up. Um, the, uh, uh, looking back on the work of the Commission on Taxation, we didn't really focus on the whole system of capital allowances which are in place, which I think are a very interesting area uh, for uh, tax expenditure, and that might be something that, that the committee might, might think about uh, asking the Department of Finance and others uh, to have a look at. Um, you know, it, it strikes me there, there are two things there. Um, uh, firstly, um, there are capital allowances, so it would seem strange that there are capital allowances associated with appreciating assets. Uh, so you know, there's a logic of capital allowances for assets that depreciate over time, furniture, um, uh, IT equipment, whatever the case is. Uh, but we also give capital allowances for assets that increase in value over time, uh, or, or more than likely to, like for example some property assets or office blocks or whatever the case is. So it's a very interesting question as to why you would give a capital allowance for an appreciating asset. Uh, and I think that's just an interesting question and it would be interesting for, uh, we've never thought about those questions would be my view. Um, uh, it may be the case that accountants have thought about them because they think in a very kind of, if I can honestly say quite narrow way about that, but in a broader public policy space we haven't thought about those things and I think it would be an interesting thing uh, to think about. Uh, within that sort of broader area of capital uh, um, allowances, the revenue commissioners in their um, figures annually uh, factor in within their estimate for that a figure for the losses that uh, companies or individuals are able to carry forward. Um, and again, that's kind of a very interesting uh, question as to, uh, uh, so in effect you can write off past losses against uh, future income. You know, at the extreme we know for some of our uh, banking institutions who would have lost vast amounts of money so much we had to rescue them uh, as the state uh, that they will more than likely not pay any uh, tax on their profits for quite some time to come irrespective of how profitable they are because they've got an accumulated set of losses. Um, that's a kind of very interesting public policy issue as to whether we should really be facilitating um, indefinitely at least if at all uh, individuals and corporates to be able to absorb that. And I think that's a very interesting uh, question and it's one you could change. My observation in, uh, of, uh, so we do it for individuals as well, so individuals who've lost money, um, for example, in share investments can claim it off subsequent profits into the future indefinitely as well. Why is it indefinitely as opposed to five years uh, to, to just pick a, a number you know, is, is I think an interesting question. Um, uh, or uh, why does it even exist at all is, is an interesting question. And certainly from observing the, the corporates who will be clearly the big beneficiaries of this, I would have thought they expect the law to change at some point. Uh, uh, they may not like the law changing clearly because it would decrease their profits and increase the uh, taxes that they pay, but you would expect them to do that. So I think there's an interesting issue there. Um, and, and again, even if it makes sense to leave that structure in place, we should know it makes sense, and I don't think we do know uh, it makes sense for, for individuals and corporates as well. Uh, and the other one that comes to mind is the Research and Development Tax Credit, which we touched upon uh, a while ago uh, as well. Um, 
the, um, uh, the, the reality with that, as it is indeed with any of the enterprise supports the state undertakes, uh, is that the, the deadweight aspect, uh, in other words, supporting things that would otherwise have happened, uh, is generally unavoidable. Uh, so it's going to happen anyway. Um, now, I suppose we can think about ways of minimizing that, but it's, it's more than likely to happen. And all of the estimates in the, say, the international research literature around enterprise supports will always have quite high expectations for what the deadweight proportion of it is. So in a sense, therefore, you are only doing it to get the bit above the deadweight, the proportion above that, uh, that is new and that you are triggering as a, a result of uh, that measure. Um, and that is all the more reason to, I think, continue to come back to these tax expenditures, particularly when they're very expensive ones, on a recurring basis to see if they're still doing that or not. Really, is it is if they are value for money, uh, because as you're more than aware, uh, we could uh, societally do all sorts of other things with those resources as well. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Uh, Deputy Chambers, are you any further questions? Uh, no, that's everything. Thank you very much, Dr. I just have a couple yeah, of well, briefs. We, we have to finish up by half six. Sure. Um, do you, would you say that in the area of, you know, capital allowances, deductibles, uh, reliefs of various sorts, again, in, in the kind of corporate area, do, do you think there is potential for a lot of abuse? Um, I personally think there is. Uh, and how do we like how do we get down and uh, and really scrutinize it to to prevent that you know i mean like i just think of you know i don't know company cars uh uh i don't know trips that are made that are supposedly business trips uh but you know actually confer a very significant benefit on the people who go on those trips and is it from a you know is it from a, a public interest point of view important that on a particular trip you stay in a five-star hotel rather than a three-star you know what I mean uh, and really bury down drill down into the, the the detail of things that are being claimed and that relief has been given on uh, and ascertain is the, is the public interest being served? Is the is the policy objective actually being met here? Is there potential abuses uh, going on? And even when you mentioned assets, like the question of even valuing assets, and then the potential you know the potential for those assets to be valued in a particular way that just suits the tax objectives of a, of a particular corporation, you know that they can up and down. The value of assets. I've seen it in company in company books, where one year assets are valued at this, and the next year they jump or they reduce, and you just think, what happened there? But it has a very convenient consequence for uh, for the company from a tax point of view. So, yeah, I mean, a, do you think there's a lot of potential for abuse, and how do we bury down? Given that there's 120, how many, I don't know how many reliefs you said, but a lot, right? Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount of reliefs bury down into the detail in order to really kind of get to the nitty-gritty of whether these things are justified at all, uh, whether they're beneficial and effective. And the other thing, just I did ask earlier, and maybe you kind of answered it, but just if you could just kind of elaborate your answer a bit. This business of what's in the base and what's discretionary, like I'm curious about that because we've got estimates about tax expenditures that range from 5 billion, you've talked about 21 billion, and I was asking the question about, you know, what about the 70 billion of, of allowances and deductions just in the corporate heading alone? Uh, how do we kind of deal with that dilemma of what is, should reasonably be in the base? I mean, I kind of feel that given the, the paucity of information we've had on these things, the lack of knowledge, the fact that it's been a kind of an unfocused on area, that really nearly everything needs to be looked at. And we need to say, okay, let we need to know a bit about it, and then we have to say, is it fair to put this into the base, or is it, in fact, something that we need to like scrutinise before we accept that it's in the base, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
Technology, two or three minutes. Okay, so good I'll, look. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll do it quickly. Um, so, um, the uh, just on the, the sort of the, that abuse uh, issue, you know, I, I think we can think about maybe big and small issues there. So there are the kind of the small ones. Uh, I think, in fairness, at least at least the rules the revenue commissioners impose around benefit and kind should be picking up that. Now, you can ask fair questions, and perhaps that's for you to ask the revenue as to how rigorously they review those and, yeah, yeah. and so on. Um, uh, but you know, there are some rules there, whereas I think there are clearly bigger issues going on in the corporate sense. You, you touched on it in terms of the ability of corporates to be able to value their own assets and change it around, which can dramatically alter um, transaction values or indeed can um, uh, trigger paper losses or paper profits or whatever the case is. So there is yeah. uh, some uh, significant uh, accountancy issues there. Um, uh, and they're very detached from the real world, I would have thought, and, and from real world activities. Um, uh, and uh, the Irish state and the Irish tax take and therefore the Irish budget uh, is, is to a degree very exposed to all of that because of our dependence uh, on a, a very small number of com companies who operate to a great degree in that way and indeed a lot of the uh, benefits we've had in the last couple of years in terms of unexpected windfall corporate tax income that's flowed into us uh, has probably been a result of the OECD BEPS process and really a result of the fact that it is no longer acceptable to be based out of various Caribbean islands mm. uh, and uh, Ireland's been one of the beneficiaries in terms of that and the tax revenue that's come from it but that, that does seem quite precarious when you think about it in a sustainable sense for, uh, for the, uh, the tax tax system. On your point on what's in the base, uh, I, I think the easiest answer to that is to say we need to start with a list. So uh, it would be good if we if we got to that. Now, in a sense, that's a list of all the measures that are in and are not in the uh, the tax expenditure, uh, the, or what's in the tax base and what's the tax expenditure. And it would be useful to have a, a full list of that. The, the Commission Taxation Report uh, provides a pretty good starting point uh, for, for that. So I think one can revisit the list from the Department of Finance uh, on that. And I think then the challenge is to continue to revisit that because we can begin to think whether it is appropriate or not to uh, have various um, assumed automatic tax reducing measures in um, uh, that, that we have as, as baseline measures and, and we can come back to revisit those to see if they're appropriate uh, or not. But having a base and having a recurring list would I think really help this committee um, and to be honest, I would probably start big with some of the big ones and start with the big themes and work from there. Uh, but I think there's a real contribution to be made to have a, a regular recurring process of looking at it and examining uh, this whole area of tax expenditure. So that will be coming shortly to the committee. Can I thank Dr. Collins for his attendance today and for the information he shared and for all the members for their attendance as well today, the there ones that are left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this meeting is now uh, concluded. Thank you.